The Unshackled Waves, episode 220. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One Australian YouTube channel whose growth has been surging this year is Australian Meditations. It provides a mixture of current political commentary, archiving various nationalist videos and news that has been produced over recent years, as well as information on Australian history. I've come to know the man behind the channel over the past few months, Stefanos. He has attended many nationalist events around Melbourne and in recent times, so I thought I'd invite him on today's show to discuss the overall aim of his channel, as well as to have him elaborate on some of his views. Stefanos, welcome to the show. Hey, Tim. Now, Australian Meditations, it has, as I said in my introduction, a wide variety of content as a mixture of your commentary on the issues of the day. There's a lot of uh, archiving of uh, prominent nationalist videos uh, from going back to the United Patriots front, Reclaim Australia days, and there's also a lot of Australian history on it. Can you describe the how this channel was born and uh, mm. what you set out to achieve with it? I'll, start, I'll, I'll preface that story with a smaller story from a bit um, from a, a few years ago. If you asked me um, maybe four or five years ago what I thought constitutes an Australian, I would have told you that anyone can be Australian, including you know Muslims and Asians, etc. Uh, I was a, a civic patriot, and then about two years ago, I came across um, certain literature, Australian nationalist literature which basically um, made me realise that actually to be an Australian had to be of European stock. And I, came, I was exposed to a lot of Henry Lawson poetry and Banjo Patterson and also the works of Percy Stevenson, who was part of the Australia First movement. I recommend everyone uh, research Percy Stevenson and also the founder of the Australian Workers' Union, um, W.G. Spence, with William Guthrie Spence. He was a massive advocate for the White Australia policy and Edmund Barton, um, William Lane, who was an Australian nationalist. And I came across a lot of Bush nationalism. And um, basically I realized, hang on, um, who else knows this information? This is really good information. Who else knows about this? Uh, because if people did know about what it means to be an Australian, the true Australian nationalism, not the multicultural, um, you know, fake, sort of uh, narrative that we're, that's been promoted today by the media and the government and other sort of areas. Um, and I realised, okay, how can I help people um, basically absorb the same information I absorbed? And I started um, in late August or early August last year, I just started making a few podcasts uh, about Australian history. I, I did a video about Nancy Wake, who was an Australian um, spy in World War II. I started doing some White Australia policy videos and um, it was slow. I, won't get, I wasn't getting a lot of views, but I, I gradually built up um, some subs and I, I got a, a loyal following of a few hundred people. And um, maybe about two months, two, three, about late last year, I had just maybe 500. And then I uploaded a video of Neil Erickson and mentioned before, I like to sort of um, upload not just the Australian history videos, but also what's happening on the nationalist scene. So a lot of Neil Erickson videos, a lot of Blair Cottrell videos. I want to keep other people up to date with what's happening on the nationalist scene. And I uploaded the video of Neil Erickson at St Kilda, where he was um, uh, he, he was confronted by some Africans at the beach. I'm sure you've all seen that video. It's gone viral. And that's got about 215,000 views right now. And once I uploaded that, I had a massive jump. I had about 3,000 subs, you know, within yeah, I, I remember seeing your yeah. subs jump during that time. So that video basically helped me sort of um, get an even bigger following. And since then, I've capitalized on it. I've, I've rode the wave, so to speak. I just keep, I keep on producing a lot of history videos because, to be honest, I prefer, I want more people to watch my history on cultural videos more than the political ones. The political ones are important, but I think that the history ones are more important. Um, and I, I think that that video really helped build a, a much bigger audience, which is what I wanted. I would have got there eventually, but um, I, I was glad that it, it came earlier rather than later. Yeah. 
You're definitely doing a good public service in archiving because I should have mentioned as well, it's also mainstream media interviews and segments and coverage that you're also archiving as well. And I've used some of it in my research and linked to them in some of, of my articles. So it's, it's very useful. And obviously, we've seen that Neil Erickson's Facebook page is now being deleted by Facebook. So all the mm -hmm. videos have disappeared, but a lot of them live on, on your uh, YouTube channel. And yeah. I, I'm just wondering, because a lot of the time, these videos might only last a few hours or so, and then they're, then they're gone forever because they're live videos. They're, they're done from a phone and uh, live stream. They're, they're not stored somewhere. So can you describe the, the system, how you archive these and ma make sure that you know, you've got a copy before uh, it's taken down by one of the social media channels? Yeah. Ever since when I, I think in 2015, I was what, 21 years old, I think it was. And um, that's when the UPF was created and Reclaim Australia was created. I went to the first UPF rally and, um, sorry, Reclaim Australia rally on April 4, 2015. And you had Sherman Burgess and the Great Aussie Patriot and the UPF and all these pages that were making videos. Even Neil Erickson was making videos under a different page, different pages. And as a young sort of nationalist, I I really liked what they were doing and I thought it was important for me to download these videos um, because it, I wanted to make sure I could show my kids what happened in 2015. We took a stand against Islam. What happened in 2016? What happened in 2017 with the court cases that happened with Blair Cottrell, etc. cetera, Neil Erickson. I wanted to have a record of, you know, what Australian nationalists achieved and what they did. That way future generations can see, okay, yeah, in 2015, people actually stood up and did something. What are we doing? So I think it's important not to deny that history to the future generations because that's just going to be the source of future activism in the future. So basically my tactic is basically if I see something, just download it. I've got a massive external hard drive that I've, okay, I have like five of them and I um, basically have different folders, you know, Australian nationalism, Australian street politics, Australian politics, Australian history. Um, and I just put all these videos in the relative folders. And then recently I, I basically ensure that, you know, all the relevant ones were uploaded and I basically upload anything that I think is relevant, um, especially the more recent ones. But I've also been uploading a lot of the old Blair Cottrell videos where he talks about different philosophical topics, you know, because I think- um, Yeah, because they were great in the day yeah. when the, the UPF page was at 120,000 likes. He used to do these live streams where he'd talk about uh, his philosophical ideas and they got heaps of engagement, but of course it doesn't exist anymore. So it's good that yeah. they're back. Yeah, I, I, every maybe once every three weeks, I'll just go into my external hard drive and I'll find another 10, 20 videos to upload for the next month gradually. Uh, I don't upload, you know, the ones that are just weird because there's some, there's some infighting videos between the Patriots. Obviously, I don't, want, I don't want to bring that up again, but all the good ones that are philosophical, that are entertaining, that are good footage of different rallies, I'll upload because I think, you know, it's, it's a good thing for us to remind ourselves of what was achieved in the past. Now, obviously, you think that Australian history is, is very important and I, obviously, you, you've spoken about how Australian meditations, you want to promote uh, white Australian nationalism because you believe that that was the foundation of Australia. And obviously, white nationalism is, is quite frowned upon and disparaged these days. And uh, even though I'm not a white nationalist myself, people mm. have a right to believe it and care about the white race and what the welfare of of white people mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting see, seeing yours that this change to multiculturalism even though it's it's pretty much uh ingrained in our society that our multiculturalism is great we've we've had people come around all, all around the world where the world's most successful multicultural country what you try to put forward in your videos that know where we're betraying what the what the purpose of Australia was. Yes, I, I want to expose the multicultural lie. Uh, diversity is our weakness. That is the new slogan that should be reverberating everywhere um, because that's what we're seeing. Everything that's happened that's wrong with Australia today, a lot of the problems that we have are a product of multiculturalism, whether it be African gangs, 
or terrorism or Sharia law, which has been pushed by certain Islamic groups and which has been catered for in some, you know, in some ways by the government with Islamic financing, for example, and other, other things. All this is a product of multiculturalism. So my job, um, alongside reminding people about what Australia is all about and what the original founding fathers intended for Australia, I basically simultaneously uh, show that multiculturalism is destroying Australia. Now, on the topic of white nationalism or Australian nationalism, is the same thing. A lot of people on face value, people who are uninitiated, so to speak, uh, would look at my channel and look at what I'm promoting and say, oh, he's obviously a, a fascist or a neo-Nazi. Racist. And that, yeah, and, and, and that's not true because um, I have been on record many times uh, I abhor national socialism in the German sense. I think that as an Australian, how can you support such a regime and we fought against them? Um, and I don't think Australian nationalism needs German national socialism because we have our own heroes and those heroes are Australians. And I talk about them on my channel. Like I mentioned before, William Guthrie Spence, William Lane, Edmund Barton, uh, Andrew um, Fisher, Alfred Deakin, you know, all these great Australian nationalists, Henry Parks, the, one of the our founding fathers who was crucial when it came to the Federation. These are the people that I look up to and all of them existed before Hitler's Germany and all of them supported Australia being a white ethno state. And I basically provide all the evidence on, on, in my videos about all these figures. And it's really good if people just look at these videos and realize that none, all, all this stuff all this literature, all this information predates German National Socialism. So why are you calling people Nazis for believing this stuff? I just believe what my ancestors believed, what the Anzacs believed. I've done two videos proving, or three videos actually, proving that the Anzacs supported a white Australia policy. It might sound you know, weird saying that, but the truth is they did. And I prov I, I, you can easily YouTube that those videos and find it. All the evidence is there. And if believing in what my ancestors believed in is racist, well, so be it. I don't care if you call me that. It's not my fault you don't understand. I just believe what my ancestors believed. If that's a crime, too bad. But it's not my fault that other people, especially on the left, don't understand history. And I think it's very easy to call anyone a Nazi. It's been overused. I think it undermines that what real National Socialism is. Because if, you, if you're calling everyone a Nazi, it basically you know, dilutes the meaning of it. I'm not the same as some person who's got a shaved head and wears um, boots and all that kind of stuff. That's not me. I'm a romantic Australian nationalist. Uh, I'm a Lawson nationalist. I believe in Henry Lawson, his poetry. I believe in the founding fathers of Australia. I don't look up to foreign regimes for inspiration. But we're at the stage now in Australian society where we're not even allowed to have that discussion. Like I said before, we've uh, we've got to... The line is these days that Australia has always been a, a melting uh, pot. And I think it's it's important for the, the truth to be out there and that we have these conversations. I'm willing to have this conversation with you. And even though I don't agree, uh, because I don't believe that all the problems that we're facing uh, today uh, have a direct 100% correlation with multiculturalism. I do believe that there are a lot of immigrants and people of other races who've made great contributions to Australia. You only saw recently how uh, good and honourable the, the Vietnamese uh, were in making sure that their businesses and families were uh, protected from the, the Sudanese thugs and yeah. they came along to St Kilda and were enthusiastic to, to, to be involved. So I, I don't... I don't believe that there's 100% causation with the end of white Australia and all the problems where we're facing today. It certainly it certainly played a part, but I don't think that as a result is for us to say no. We we need to have 100% white Australia to eradicate all these problems. Well, I can respond to that. Firstly, I don't doubt for one second that all immigrants are evil and they're, they're destroying the country. I don't believe that for one second. I've met more immigrants who are more patriotic and more Australian in a lot of ways than those white leftists that you see at university and at all these Aboriginal rallies, every Australia Day burning the Australian flag. 
that's undeniable. My issue is that when it comes to immigration, you have to judge immigration as a collective. Anyone can point out all the good stories and all the bad stories. You know, a terrorist here, but a Muslim business owner, owner here, which is great. Obviously, there's good and bad in every um, culture. What my issue is, is, is that for every good one, you might get a bad one, and you might have maybe 10 good ones and two bad ones, but the two bad ones will be the really bad ones. They'll be your rapists, they'll be your terrorists, they'll be the people who are promoting Sharia law. And um, I just think that it's like the old analogy of a Skittles bowl, you know, if 5% of them are poisoned, why would you put your put your hand in the bowl and, 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 and grab some? You know, it's it just, to me, it's just ridiculous. And I just think that we have all the recipes we need, so to speak. If I want to get a kebab or make a kebab, there's a great thing called Google. I can just Google the recipe for that. I don't need to bring Islam to Australia because... <laughs> so good food, is, isn't it? Enough yeah, to convince but, 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 but the thing is, Tim, is that if I do bring Muslims into Australia, sure, I'll get the kebabs and stuff, which is, you know, some people would say that's good. I don't think, I, don't, I personally don't eat kebabs like the first few lagis being Greek. But the thing is, um, apart from the kebabs, you're also getting, you know, people promoting Sharia law. You're getting people who will ride on the streets because of a film made in America which happened in 2012. Remember that the, the Sydney riots in uh, America. Don't, don't had, get me wrong. I'm yeah, not a... hundreds of people who were you know who were rioting on the streets, and those people you know have values that are completely antithetical to Australian values. They're not loyal to Australia. They hate Australia, and it, 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 this will get worse and worse. The next time someone makes a movie against Islam, it'll be even worse because the population is going to grow. So I just want to make sure that um i want to make it clear that i think that there are some great immigrants out there but i just think if we need immigrants we can easily get them from european countries because they're the ones who you know will give you all the good stuff the food and the, the being all the good uh, european doctors and nurses and all that kind of stuff which i'm all for but you won't get the gangs and the sharia law and all that kind of stuff yeah oh, don't don't get me wrong i'm not a, a conservative on the the immigration question who and believe that we should always have a non-discriminatory immigration policy for example i support trump's travel ban from <laughs> countries in the middle east north africa in fact i think he should have included more countries like i'm in favor of us suspending immigration from arab and north african countries because of the the problems we have faced but like, and like you said before, you judge the immigration experiment as a whole, as a collective. For, yes. To be more specific, I'm not opposed to immigration from India or Southeast mm. Asia. I think those immigrants have made good contribution and the second and third generation of them integrate well and they pretty much speak with, 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 with Australian accents. And this is why I don't go as far as the white nationalists because these immigrants have, pro have proven themselves that they can not just integrate, but assimilate. Mm. And so I well, think well, that's why yeah. there's got to be this separation. Well, on that point, it's true and it's kind of not true as well. I'll put this to you, Tim. And this is also a question to whoever's watching and to the audience. Australia has a lot of Chinese immigrants and Indian immigrants. And um, let's just talk about the Chinese, just as an example. Now, I think that we're gonna have a big problem with the Chinese immigrants in the future. I think that they, um, as a collective, not as individuals, as a collective, they're just a, a tiger waiting to pounce. And when shit hits the fan, so to speak, in the future, um, perhaps when there's a war between America and China, which may happen, or something else might happen, I don't know. How many of those ethnic Chinese living in Australia, whether they're first, second, or third generation, will side with Australia? And just to put it in context, when we were fighting the Japanese in World War II, we had literally concentration camps. We, we didn't kill them, but we just housed them in, in camps. Yeah, internment in, camps. Yeah, internment, that's the one. Internment camps, that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, my bad. So internment camps, and one of them was called Kara. And there was a massive breakout at Kara. You can easily Google it, called the Kara Breakout. Done some videos on it. Really interesting history. Um, some of them tried to break out, and some of the di people, diggers that were serving there as guards were the, the older ones or the ones that weren't fit for, weren't fit for overseas service. They were a bit weak. They weren't like the, the, you know, the, the, the prime Aussie bloke. Uh, it was more older people and younger people. And um, they killed some of our boys and stuff. The point is that if there was a, a war tomorrow with China, 
what would happen with the ethnic Chinese here, especially the more recent ones that have come? Would they fight for Australia? Or if we have a 10% Chinese population in Australia, which we almost do, we have about 8% of them, whatever they are, who are Asian. Um, last time I checked, you've got about 15% and growing of Oriental people in Australia. Most of them are probably Chinese. I don't know the exact figures, but I just know there's a lot of Chinese. How hard would it be to control these people? I reckon Box Hill in Melbourne, you know, Cabramatta in Sydney, it'll you'll need the right police to go in those areas and try to quell all the riots that will happen. Because if we're going to fight China, okay, I can guarantee you that not every Chinese person in Australia uh, is going to support that decision. And they're going to either fly back to China to fight us or they're going to have form guerrilla gangs here in Australia and they're going to cause a lot of problems. So it sounds, I don't doubt that a lot of them are business people and that's fine. Uh, but I just think that when things hit the fan in the future, um, we won't be prepared. We're gonna, it's going to come out of nowhere. We're going to, the Chinese dragon is going to engulf us and we're going to have a very hard time um, controlling them because they're very nationalistic people. They're very tradi traditional people. And I respect that. I just wish that they were who they were in China. Australia belongs to Australians. Australia for Australians, as Bruce Ruxton would have said, uh, former president of the Victorian RSL. And I think that there's a lot of benefits, you know, economic ones, fair enough, but they're very short-term benefits. And um, I think that, to me, culture matters more. Um, if we need immigrants, like I said, we can get them from Europe and not have problems. Um, and I think that we don't really need the Asians in Australia because that's going to basically cause some problems in the future if things hit the fan. Well, the issue that you mentioned there with China, that's because their government is an authoritarian, big brother, communist government. And so a lot of them, when they come over here, they've obviously still got Chinese citizenship. The Chinese government is still very controlling of them. So I think the issue there is not with the, the Chinese people as a race or culture. It's with the fact that they've got, Absolutely. This, they've Absolutely. got this government, which Absolutely. is basically has this huge influence over over people and if you see what the chinese government with their social credit program it's basically a, a form of mass surveillance uh, yes. control so Absolutely. i don't think that's a a problem specific to the, the to the chinese it's just a authoritarian government which could happen anywhere well yes and um i think that it's 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 definitely that uh but at the end of the day there's a lot of Chinese in Australia who support the Chinese government and who are very loyal to the Chinese government. We know that they have they embed spies in the business community, the Chinese government. Um, I know that, um, for example, when I think there was the – what's the, the – the Tibetans, when they were having a protest, I think, a few years ago outside of Camp Parliament House, there were a lot of Chinese students shipped from Sydney University, etc., yeah. who went and protested because they were told by maybe the Chinese embassy – to go on and do that. Now, that's a Tibetan issue. Imagine if there was a war, you know, with Australia. Imagine what would happen then. That, that's, what, that's what I think people need to start talking about. There's no one's, people are talking about Apex and Islam, which I'm all for. But um, we should be talking about Asianization because that's going to be a, a big problem in the future. And on top of that, just to put it in a bit of a historical context, Tim, a lot of our founding fathers uh, admitted in their journals and in their writings and in, in, in their speeches in Hansard that it wasn't, we don't want, the reason why they didn't want Asians into Australia wasn't necessarily because um, they were, you know, uh, inferior. Some some of our founding fathers believe that. Evan Barden certainly believed, for example, our first prime minister believed that Asians were inferior. But some of them also believed that they were superior. And that was the reason why a lot of our founding fathers didn't want them in Australia, because they recognised that these people were very industrious, they work very hard, and if we bring them en masse, they'll basically, you know, form their own businesses and they'll be a form of cultural, a gradual cultural imperialism. And I think that they're pretty much, you know, on the mark because if you look at the Asian population in Australia, um, they're a lot more intelligent in terms of IQ. And also, um, if you look at Melbourne High um, and other selective schools like McRobinson's Girls, now, when I, I actually tried applying to Melbourne High in Year 9, I didn't make it. There were basically six exams I had to do. I think a couple of maths ones, some English ones and whatever. And I aced maybe three of them and I didn't do very well on the maths ones. And to go to Melbourne High, you need to be good at all of them. 
and I didn't I didn't get in. And I remember in the exam room, I kid you not, 90% of the people who were applying to go to these selective schools were Indian or Asian. I was one of maybe one in 10 people who were white. Um, and I remember I did a lot of tutoring before I applied and most of my tutoring class were Indian and Asian. And that was what a long time ago, that was like 2008. Now it's probably worse because, you know, the population's probably grown since then. And if you look at the statistics, I'm reading some articles about this, um, the percentage of Asians at these schools, is disproportional. There are way more Asians than white people in the selective schools. And all these kids who are Asian, who are doing really well in your sciences and your maths and even in English as well, who are ducksing all their, you know, subjects and getting scholarships, they're going to be top tier officials one day. You might have a future prime minister there. You might have a future minister or a future business person, CEO. And I, I think that in the long term, you might even have Chinese spies who basically try and get them to, you know, leak information and do their bidding. This is long down the track, you know, but I know that during the Cold War, the Russians did the same thing with the illegals program. I don't know if you've seen the Americans, the Australian, yeah. same sort of thing, you know, um, they could have their own sort of, you know, group of people who are undermining Australia and leaking, you know, corporate information and national security information. This is, this is all possible. And I think it will happen at a greater extent than it does now. You mentioned Apex and Islam there as they're discussed a lot in the, the media about the, the problems that they're causing. But I, I do believe that the Chinese influence is becoming more prominent in the Australian political discourse obviously there was a, a hack attack of the the major parties <laughs> earlier this week and a lot of people suspected uh, China and let's not forget what happened to uh, Sam Dastyari with his yep. Chinese connection it cost him his political career so I, I definitely believe that our, our leaders and certainly our security agencies I, I are very aware of this threat yeah but what are they doing about it that's the thing I was only just recently I saw a video just to enlighten the viewers, the Australian military complex, there was a top Australian officer who's now retired or something. And um, he came to the media, uh, there was a video a few days ago that I saw, and he basically admitted, he did a whole analysis of Australia's ability to ward off cyber threats. And he basically admitted that um, a lot of the um, civilian parliament house, for example, and other civilian sort of um, departments that liaise with defense aren't able to basically yeah, deal with cyber attacks from China, for example. They're just too weak. I think some of the more high, you know, the, the, the real national security, like SAS, for example, and the Australian Army, I think apparently they, they are protected cyber-wise, but a lot of other areas that liaise with defence that are civilian in nature, apparently, um, according to this top-tier sort of officer, you know, whoever, I forgot his name, he basically said that we're woefully unprepared for those kind of attacks. And what we're seeing now is just like a message. Let's face it, it was a Chinese that did the, the, the recent Canberra thing. I mean, who else could it be? They just want to send a message to us that we can do this. It's just a way of saying that we can do this. Don't mess with us because in future, if things hit the fan, we'll get a lot worse. And they can definitely do that. And with energy, with a lot of things, they can, they can, warfare isn't just guns and bullets anymore. It's also cyber. Everyone knows that, all the analysts acknowledge that. And Australia really needs to, you know, smarten up and invest more in ways to counteract this. But it's actually quite scary because I don't even know what they can do. You know, I've got a failure of imagination. I can just imagine that I reckon there are things that we don't even know about that they can do that would really undermine our safety and our security. One thing I wanted to explore with you, now you're of a Greek ethnic background, but you're also an Australian white nationalist and there's been a lot of, uh, well there is a lot of debate whether Greeks are actually white because yeah. they're, they're oh, Greeks and Italians, they're considered... Or, they're more olive, they're more yeah, olive. There's plenty of uh, dark yep. skinned people from those areas and they're called what's collectively known as, as Wogland. I mean, I'm sure yep. you're aware of uh, the Greeks and Italians who came here in the, in the 50s and yep. the, the, yep. the term wog is ingrained in Australian culture. So I'm just curious, how, how do you reconcile that given that, well, yep. Greeks and Italians are considered part of the recent immigration to Australia? Look, um, I think that there was obviously some racism in the past towards the Greeks and the Italians. And 
for good reason. I mean, you can't blame uh, Anglo-Australians for, you know, being a bit angry because the culture that the Greeks and the Italians brought were, was a, a lot different to what Anglos were, were used to. And I think in a lot of ways that racism that the Greeks faced, in some weird way, it actually helped them assimilate because they wanted to fit in more. For example, I went to a lecture. I'll get, I'll get to your point, but I just want to mention this first. I went to a lecture late last year about Kokoda and the Greeks, the Greek Anzacs who fought Kokoda. And there was actually quite a few. And um, they had to change their last names because you had a lot of Opolises and Edes and, you know, the Greek last names are, are very um, large. And that was very hard for a lot of commanders to kind of say, because I went to cadets for four years and that's not, that's not the mil that's not the army, but it's like a teenage military organization. And we would, would refer to each other by our last names. And it's going to be very hard to call a hey, Papadopoulos. It's too, in, 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 when you're in, when you're in battle, you can't really say that it's just too weird and too hard. So a lot of the Greeks had to basically shorten their last names to like, you know, instead of Pavlos, which is being Peter in Greek, this is a Pete or Peter make it anglicize your, your name or your last name. And um, that's why in a lot of um, Anzac names, you can tell some of them look, seem can be Anglo, but then you actually research the backgrounds, they're actually Greek or Italian, for example. Um, so I think that the racism at the time helped Greeks assimilate by changing their names, for example, being more Australian. I think that was in a way a good thing. But at the same time, I think that Australia is a European brotherhood. And if you go back to history, as I said before, plenty of quotes dictate that, say that to be an Australian, you have to be of European stock. Governments at the time were letting in Greeks and Italians at a very slow rate. They didn't want too many. There was actually a quota at some, time, at some point for Greeks without only that 30 in a month, I think it was, or a week. I forgot, I forgot exactly. But after World War II, that's when uh, the immigration minister, Arthur Corwell, uh, realized that we need to populate or perish. I'm sure people have heard of that term before because we realized that we almost got debated by, Jap by Japan. So we need to bring a lot more immigrants because we need more people to defend Australia. And that's when they started bringing in literally boatloads of Greeks and Italians and Yugoslavians. And I just think that you can be an Australian and you can be a Greek. I don't call myself Greek Australian. I think that's wrong. I think you're an Australian, but you can also be simultaneously Greek but if you're a real Australian, you have to put Australia first. And unfortunately, I think there's, to a certain extent, there's been a failure of assimilation in Australia when it comes to the Greeks and some Italians, not all of them, but just some of them. For example, when Greece played Australia in, in the soccer, yeah, there were, there were plenty of Greeks who barred for Greece, and I just think that's wrong. I think you barred for Australia. You're born in Australia. If Greece was playing any other team in the world, I'd go for Greece 100%. I love Greece to death. I'm a, I'm a Greek nationalist as well. But if you're born in Australia and you're living here as a person of Greek ethnicity, you should support the country that has provided your parents with a house, with water, with food, with opportunity. And it's all, it's all good to have, you know, the home country, so to speak, and to care about that. I, I follow the politics in Greece. I know a lot about Greek, I don't know about Greek history, but Australian history. So I've been researching Greek history for a lot, a lot longer. Um, but I just think that on the one hand, it, it's the fault of the Greeks, but I think it's more the government's fault for not assimilating the Greeks properly because they should have said, listen, you're here. It's great. We want you to be taxpayers and whatever. But part of the deal is you can have your own culture. That's fine. But when it comes to loyalty, you have to put Australia first. And everyone is puts, you know, you know the, the oath when you come become a citizen, I put Australia. I forgot the, the exact wording, but it basically says I swear loyalty to Australia. Well, clearly, a lot of immigrants don't actually believe that because if they did, they wouldn't be barracking for Greece, you know, in the soccer. Now, obviously, that's a small, it's a stupid, it's a soccer match. The worst yeah. thing that happened between Greece and Australia is a soccer match, okay? But what if there's a war? There, won't, there, will, ne there will never be a war between Greece and Australia, best friends. But what if a Chinese Australian who swears all to Australia, then what do they do? You know, so the question, who would you fight for? That's easy for you to answer. Absolutely, Australia. But the thing is, it's not even a, a relevant question because the Greeks and the Australians are brothers. We've fought on the same side. For example, there was Greek volunteers in Gallipoli who fought with the Aussies in Gallipoli because, you know, the Greeks and the Turks hate each other. So we wanted to go and fight the Turks and help you guys out in World War Two. You know, the Anzacs came to Greece and they fought alongside the Greeks. You know, in Vietnam, Greeks were fought in Vietnam and Korea. 
um, not just Greek soldiers, but also Australians of Greek heritage fought as Anzacs in World War II and World War I and, and Vietnam and Korea. So the history between Greece and Australia is so, it's a beautiful history. It's a, we've shared blood together. We've, um, you know, shed blood together. It's a brother, they're brother countries. And I'm, I'm all for maintaining that relationship and strengthening it. Um, but I do think that any Australian of Greek heritage is in Australia. They should put Australia first. And I, I support them learning Greek and going Greek dancing. I used to go Greek dancing for a couple of years. I can speak Greek. I'm more for that. But there needs to be an overarching nationalism, the Australian nationalism, that everyone of any ethnicity, whether they're Irish, Scottish, Italian, Greek, Serbian, whatever background you are, we need to all tap into this overarching Australian nationalism. Otherwise, we're just becoming tri tribalistic. And I think it's wrong to do that. And Greeks are white people in your opinion? Absolutely. The only reason, and this is funny, the only reason why Greeks are a bit olive is because in Greece, 300 days of the year, it's sunlight. It's like 30 degrees and up. So obviously people, it's not because we're genetically a bit olive. It's because of the climate. Greeks and Italians live in a very hot area. You know, we live right next to Africa. And if you look at the racial studies that have been done, genetics, um, just Google, are Greeks white? you'll find re a lot of recent studies that prove that I think 75% of the Greek DNA is directly descended from the Mycenaeans. And the Mycenaeans were, they basically created ancient Greece. They were, from the Mycenaeans came the Athenians and from there they migrated. So our DNA is, you know, relatively clean. It's very European, you know, so it's undeniable that Greeks are, are white. And therefore, if they try and they assimilate properly, they can also be Australian. Now, you've got pretty strong views against uh, race mixing or, as it's also known, uh, miscegenation. In one video, you talked about when you uh, saw a mixed-race couple on the street, a, a white person with a non-white person, you thought about the thousands of white uh, babies that were not being born. Mm. Uh, why is that so troubling for you? Well, just for the record, I didn't write that article. That was just an article that I found online, which I agree with. So I do agree with that statement, but I didn't write that article. But the reason why is because I think that culture stems from race. And um, the reason why Greeks are Greeks and the Brits are Brits and the Serbs are Serbs culturally with all their beautiful folk dancing and their languages and stuff, and I, I love that, is because they've maintained a level of ethnic purity. I don't think that if all of a sudden every woman in Britain or Australia married an Asian or a, a black person and had babies with them, those kids would be able to produce Australian culture. You wouldn't have, you know, if that happened in 1900 or 1850, you wouldn't have Henry Lawson. You wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't have Australian culture. You have a, a hybrid sort of culture. And I think that apart from the destruction of culture, you're also destroying your race because your phenotype you know i think it's a beautiful thing when a grandparent has grandkids who look exactly like them you know i've had the tragedy of witnessing you know grandparents who have grandkids who don't look like them and i've seen the results of that because they can't communicate properly with their grandparents because they can't speak the language they don't know what it means to be you know greek for example because you know they can't talk greek because the the kids of the, of those of that grand of the grandparents their kids married into an african family or something it's very rare that this happens but i have seen it a couple of times and i just think that uh, it's wrong because we like it or not you're undermining the ability of that child to absorb greek culture and produce greek culture or whatever culture it is uh, because now they're confused they're half Arabic or half black and half Greek and you know it's confusing for them and it's very hard to keep up with all those things and to reconcile those identities you know how can you be for example Greek and Turkish because those two countries have a huge history of bloodshed of warfare so which side do you take for example what if you're Christian Muslim you know it's there's a lot of things people don't take into account here I, I just think it's easier if you just stick to your own and that's the best way to do it because it's just easier on the kids, on the grandparents. It looks better. I think that kids that are people that are ethnically pure are, are more attractive. 
you know, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, you know, uh, Eurasians, for example. Not that I hate them. I just think that I've seen them and I just think that people that are ethnically pure are better. But I just think it's it solves more problems. It, it You know, it creates a lot of problems if you go with someone else who doesn't belong to your race. So you definitely only procreate with a Greek girl? Yes. Um, well, I think that it's okay for other European blood to mix to a certain extent as long as um, it's a European race. So I've seen Greeks marry Italians and Greeks marry Australians, and I think that's fine. But once you go, you know, white and Oriental or white and black, that's where I, I draw the line. I think there is some room for, you know, intercultural exchange in a European sense. Um, I would avoid that, but I don't mind it as much. But what I, what I really don't like is when white girls, you know, go with black people, Asian people. I just think that there should be laws against that because it, it's not going to, it's just wrong. It's not, and not just that, but also the historical point, Tim, that we fought for a certain identity. And I just don't think for, for a spring roll dinner every, every uh, day after work, it's not worth sacrificing what our ancestors fought for just because you, you're, you're in love with an Asian woman. I mean, there are plenty of white girls out there fall in love with one of them. It's not like white girls have become extinct. You know, just stick to your own. Um, because I think that um, our ancestors wanted us to be Australian. And like I said, to be culturally Australian, you have to be racially European. And if you lose that genetic basis, you won't have Australian culture anymore. Like I said, um, culture stems from race. You also take a strong stand against uh, homosexuality in Western society. You did a, a video talking about the Australian embassy in, in Greece uh, promoting an LGBT pride uh, parade. And in that video, you mentioned that we should have laws against uh, homosexuality like they do in Africa and the Middle East and, yep. and Russia. Do you want to clarify what, because obviously it's a unpopular opinion, given that everyone thought it was great that Australia voted in favour of uh, same-sex marriage and we have all the the media and uh, the political class celebrating the, the LGBT festival uh, events. So, yeah, well, well, yeah, hang on a second. Not everyone. Remember, 38% of Australians voted against gay marriage. Mm. So if we had another 13% of people voted against it, it, would have not, it wouldn't have passed. And not everyone supports Mardi Gras. A lot of people are against it. Um, but that said, the way I see it is the only way to sort of stop all this is if you really change the goalposts. For example, in Africa and in Uganda, and in a lot of Middle Eastern countries where homosexuality is banned, a lot of gay people are basically in the closet. And I think that's a good thing because that basically means that they're too scared to basically come out and be who they are. And their energy is, is spent on basically surviving. Now, in Australia and in a lot of Western countries, gays have been given a lot of rights. And as a result, they spend their energy not on surviving or staying in the closet and not trying to keep that entity their, their homosexuality under the rug so they can get a job, for example, which used to happen back in the day in Australia, the good old days. Um, but the thing is, now you've given an inch, they've taken a mile. Now, because of that energy, they can spend that energy and that time promoting, you know, all sorts of crazy things like Mardi Gras um, and uh, safe schools and all this stuff, which never would have happened. Now, that would never happen in Africa because they haven't even got gay marriage. They're not even allowed to be gay legally. So good luck. It's going to be a very long time for them to get to the stage where they, they're promoting safe schools because right now it's not even legal to be gay. So if it's not legal to be gay, how can you have a basis, a platform to create safe schools and a Mardi Gras parade? So I just think that if in Australia we had those sort of laws, the homosexual community and the lobbies would be fighting for their rights to exist rather than their rights to a parade and for, to have safe schools programs. So I just think to solve a problem, you need to, you know, solve it by, by the root. You know, you can't just clip it every now and then, which is what the conservatives do. They're trying to ban safe schools. The Liberal Party in Victoria wants to ban safe schools, which I'm all for. But if you really want to deal with the homosexual propaganda, you basically need to go to its root, and that is homosexuality itself. Going back to, you mentioned that you think that race mixing should be illegal, and obviously you believe the same with, with homosexuality. So you believe that it's moral to regulate 
human relationships because obviously there's even people on the right who say well you can't help you know who you fall in love with why should that be a crime yes i, I do think that um we should regulate those kind of relationships because the government regulates a lot of things like this is the thing is that there are a lot of laws that regulate our ability to do things whether it be how we dress or what we can say unfortunately that, i'm all for free speech that's one thing i don't think the government should regulate but I don't like this argument that says, oh, who you love is who you are is who you are and who you love is who you love. But the thing is, it's more complicated than that because what you're doing as a gay person is basically changing the culture for the worse. Uh, you're basically creating a culture that's in a lot of ways degenerate and which is basically teaching kids, you know, to be, you know, uh, sexualized. A lot of these Mardi Gras rallies you have you know, kids dressed up, you know, revealing their skin at a very young age. It's very promiscuous. And that, whether we like it or not, I, I think is just wrong because I don't think people should be promiscuous so publicly. And um, the homosexual community, a lot of them, especially the ones that attend these rallies, they do this. You know, you see them kissing in public. You see them half naked parading. So I, I think because if, 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 the, if the homosexual woman wasn't doing this, I wouldn't have an issue. If they weren't doing money rough roads, there wouldn't be an issue. But the fact that they're taking it so far makes me want to basically go back to what things used to be like, where gay marriage wasn't even an issue back in the 50s because everyone was against it. That's what I want. I want it to be go back in time and stick to how we used to deal with this because um, right now, you know, we're on the back foot. It's the conservatives and the nationalists who are on the back foot. We're fighting to basically get rid of safe schools. Instead of, you know, us fighting against that, I'd rather the homosexuals fight to exist as a minority legally and to be recognised. I'd rather they fight for themselves and who they are rather than us being on the back foot and fighting against their safe schools programs and their Mardi Gras parades. It's, it's one or the other. Unfortunately, the pendulum will always be on, on one. There's no middle ground here. It's either one side is going to be on the back foot or the other side is going to be on the back foot. There's no middle ground. We can't come to a consensus. The, 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 the lobbies will always push to the most extreme. And because that's true, people like myself realise that the only solution is to basically push it to the extreme, to the other end of the pendulum. Now, you mentioned the Safe Schools program, which is well, it's supported by the, the teachers in the, in the schools. Well, it's, it's a teacher's resource, we're told. It's not a education program which doesn't make it any less bad and uh, this is uh, obviously teachers they they promote other left-wing causes such as there's been the climate change protest they're having another one soon there's also the teachers for refugees and you've done a bit of investigating uh, on this uh, topic because it's popped up in the news Mm -hmm. Every every now and then, teachers are being exposed promoting leftist agenda to children. Do you want to go into detail on what you've been up to? Yeah. So um, late last year, I think October last year, there were some articles about a group called Teachers of Refugees. They've got a Facebook page, so I recommend people check that out. They've also got a website, and um, one of their spokespeople is a woman called Lucy Honan. H-O-N-A-N. Now, Lucy is actually an actual communist. She writes for a group called Solidarity. I went on Solidarity's website. One of the first things you see is a quote from Karl Marx. So they're overt communists. And she is a teacher, and she works at St. Albans High School. That's on public record, by the way. Everyone knows that. And on her Facebook, she's got photos of herself and other teachers who are wearing um, T-shirts in support of refugees. And she went on 3AW Neil Mitchell program two years ago and also last year to be interviewed because they've had re these rallies for a couple of years now. And the point of the rally late last year was to get kids off Nauru. And she admitted on live radio, and I, I put the radio interview on my YouTube so you can check it out. She admitted that she'll be telling her students to attend these pro-refugee rallies which were happening on a Saturday, I think it was. So imagine having a communist teacher getting paid by the public service, by, 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 the, by the Australian taxpayer. Basically, she's a communist, and she's also telling your kids to attend the pro-refugee rally. Now, my issue with that is 
I always thought teachers were apolitical. And from my understanding of the policies that regulate how teachers have to behave in the classroom, I researched it, I, I emailed and I called the Department of Education in Victoria. They sent me their own statutes and I analysed them and they basically admitted to me on the phone that yes, this, this basically does breach our own policies. And I'm like, okay, what are you doing about it? Shouldn't you reprimand this woman? Shouldn't you do something? You know, that way she doesn't do it again. This is two years in a row she's been doing this, a couple of years now. And um, basically, from what I understood, they've got policies, but it all depends on the principal. This is where it comes down to, is that the principal decides where, how they apply the policies. Apparently, they, have to, they, have, they must follow the policies, but it all depends on interpretation. So basically, that means that if the teachers, if the principal is left wing, wing, they can choose whether they want to punish this teacher. And I actually called and I spoke to the, the principal of the school, and they basically gave me the impression that this will be solved internally, and they wouldn't return any of my calls, any of my emails. They said, you've made your complaint. We're not going to do anything about this. Then I decided to make an e a video about it, and I, I made a video about uh, what I went through with the Department of Education and the fact that they were ignoring my calls, and I, I mentioned you know, their, their policies, et cetera. And there was a person who commented, and this person actually is, knows Lucy Honan. He's a, he's a teacher. And uh, he basically emailed me. He told me there's been at least 30 sort of um, complaints against this teacher internally. So not just people like me complaining from the outside, but also um, people on the inside, actual teachers complaining against this particular teacher for various reasons. And basically, that means that Lucy Honan, apparently, and I've been told by my source that this will happen in the next six months, that she'll be basically put up on some sort of panel. Whenever there's an internal complaint, that means that this must happen. This is the process. And she'll be interviewed by a panel of judges who are going to basically analyze what she's done, if she's done anything wrong, and then derive a certain conclusion and potentially a, a punishment. She might lose her teaching license. She might get fired. I don't know what sort of punishments they have. It all depends on who they are. If they're left wing, they'll basically let her go. If they're neutral or right wing or whatever, and they're truthful to you know the policies that they apparently uphold, they'll punish her. And um, hopefully something happens because I think that this is the sort of activism we need to do. We need to basically root out all these activist teachers who are promoting not just refugees but also you know, um, climate change activism, as you've probably seen recently, where they're getting mm. kids to protest against climate change. It's really, really scary because the way I see it, if any right-wing teacher, and there are right-wing teachers, I know some of them, but none of them would ever go into a classroom and tell their students to go to an anti-abortion rally, for example, or an anti-gay marriage rally, or they would, they would never wear a T-shirt that says a marriage between a man and a woman or abortion is murder. Because if they did, you have a lot of parents calling and going crazy and saying, oh, you're, you know, you're a racist or whatever and, you know, this and that, and that person would get fired. So I think that that sort of pressure that would happen if a right-wing teacher did that should happen for these left-wing teachers. And I wish that more and more people would call up and give the department, you know, a hard time. Because if we all called up and emailed them, they would have to do something that because they, they can't afford their resources are limited. They can't afford to get all these calls and these emails. They would have to basically, you know, deal with this teacher and tell her to shut up. And if there was a petition and if they had a you know, 50 people calling a day and emails had to respond to, it would be inconvenient for them. And they'd have to basically say, listen, we can't afford this to happen next year. You know what? You're fired. Or you know what? If you do it again, you're fired. They'll basically put in some measures to basically stop these teachers from being so activist. And I just think in future, perhaps some um, right-wingers can be more organized than, and basically coordinate some sort of response that's legal, that's justified, like a petition, or you know, basically encouraging people through Facebook to call the department and complain about this. And I think we can definitely root out these teachers and set an example. That way it doesn't happen in the future. Yeah, that's amazing that they're actually considering disciplinary action against uh, this teacher yep. because it has seemed like such a school the education system has seemed like a lost cause so well done on that that's that's pleasing to hear thank you now moving to Australian politics as a whole now obviously for nationalists the leader of the or nationalist cause was seen to be Pauline Hanson it was if you got up in 
parliament in 1996 and said we are in danger of being swamped yeah. by Asians. But since her second second coming, her, her reinvention, she's taken a lot more of a civic nationalist line. Uh, she said you don't have to be white to, to be in one nation. She's moved on to talking about uh, Islam. And obviously this change was most evident in her reaction to Fraser Anning, her former One Nation colleague's maiden speech, where he uh, lamented the demise of the, the White Australia policy and wanted a plebiscite on to have predominantly European immigration to Australia. She called this appalling, saying it was straight from Goebbels' handbook. And then there's yep. also been recently in the New South Wales state election, they're going to be running a, a Muslim candidate. And Fraser Anning, obviously, with this more explicitly uh, white nationalist line, has, has gained a lot of support uh, from the nationalist community. Do you believe that he is the new standard bearer of the of the cause absolutely 100 percent uh fraser running has replaced pauline hansen as you can remember oh, we weren't born but um i remember because i researched it myself i wasn't born at the time but at the time pauline was saying a lot of controversial things just like fraser running is doing right now and that to me indicates that fraser running is the new pauline hansen or is replacing Pauline hansen because he's saying a lot of things that people agree with just like a lot of people agree with Pauline Hanson at the time. As controversial as they are, a lot of people agree with Fraser Anning. And I think the polls are very clear. People do want to stop immigration. People do want to ban on Islamic immigration, especially, you know, um, and Fraser Running is just tapping into that. And I think that when it comes to Pauline Hanson, I think James Ashby, perhaps, the new homosexual advisor that she's got, um, and also to a certain extent, Mark Latham, who's a former Labor Party leader. I think they're kind of influencing her. Even before these people came on board, she was cucking out just a bit. But ever since these people come on board, in my opinion, I've noticed the change of attitude when it comes to her. She's definitely, you know, changed her rhetoric. Uh, I did some videos exposing this, basically showing videos of what Pauline Hanson used to say when it came to Islam. There's, she's on, on record as saying she wouldn't sell her house to a Muslim. You know? I think she said an Asian as well. She, uh, that might have she been said an Asian. Well. No, she said she said an Asian who is from overseas. She had no problem with selling a house to an Asian who lives in Australia, who's an Australian citizen. But she definitely said she would never sell her house house to a Muslim, even while I'm living in Australia. And I just think to myself, I juxtapose that. I basically put that video, that snippet of her saying that, and then I put a video right next to it, basically of Emma Eros being endorsed by Paul and Hanson. Does that mean that? She would sell her house to, to Emma Eros. Well, I'm pretty sure if you ask Point Hanson that, I am certain that she would say yes, she would sell her house to Emma Eros. Well, she's letting goes her run under the Pauline Hanson name. Yeah, exactly. Which which means that she's she's basically backtracked on this whole, you know, selling a house to a Muslim. But not just that. She's also on record as saying that she wants a Muslim ban stopping Islamic immigration. She is on, on record saying that numerous times. And I did a video showing all the snippets of that. And um, then I put a video of Emma Eros saying that One Nation doesn't want to ban Islamic immigration. So people are confused. A lot of people that use to support Point Hanson, like myself and other people who have been supporting Hanson, uh, I don't live in Queensland, but I still supported her. I, I, I was happy that she won. She, she, she got into the parliament, so to the Senate, sorry. And then I'm like, hang on a sec. She, what she's saying is basically going against what she used to say. Uh, and then no wonder so many people are disaffected and people are jumping ship to people like Fraser Running and to Australian Conservatives, perhaps, or other right-wing parties. Yeah. And obviously you mentioned that you've been involved in nationalist activism uh, yourself since the, the Reclaim Australia United Patriots Front uh, days. Obviously, we've uh, met in real life. You've attended the, the Aussie Pride flag march. Uh, you've also accompanied uh, Neil Erickson on his various uh, adventures uh, out in public. Where do you see the, the street activism fitting into the, the overall nationalist cause? I've always believed that the politics of the street is the politics of the future, as in, as in politics in parliament. And I think that um, the reason why the left wing is so dominant is because they're so much better at us when it comes to street movements. 
you know, there are refugee groups, there are abortion groups that have rallies, there are so many different segmented left-wing groups that have their rallies. For the first time in a while, Australians in 2015 rose because of the Sydney stage, I think it was, that prompted the, the rallies, the reclaim rallies, and people just organised for a brief period and said, you know what, we're not going to take it anymore. We're going to have a rally. And we did, they did have a rally. And I think that um, it showed that things are changing in Australia gradually, and it's changed the Overton window. People started talking about Islam. It became acceptable to talk about the influence of, you know, the correlation between immigration of, from Muslim countries and terrorism. A long time ago, perhaps you couldn't even mention that, but because of what's been happening with terrorism and because of the street movement and the numbers that have occurred at these rallies, politicians are basically saying, yeah, we hear you. Um, and they, some of them, sometimes they actually formulate policy based on what they've seen and the numbers, like Fraser Anning definitely has done that. And maybe a lot of the um, immigration policies of limiting immigration that Tony Abbott wanted to do was perhaps based on some of these reclaim rallies because people were concerned about immigration. So I think that it's a good way to influence politics. And I just think that we need to show that we're, we're there and we're active and a display of patriotism publicly is always a good thing. I just think having rallies where there's flags around has always been part of Australian tradition, whether it be an Anzac Day parade or something political, like the New Guard, for example, back in the 30s was an Australian nationalist group, and they would basically go and disrupt communist meetings and Labor Party meetings, and they have fights on the street. Um, that was a long time ago, but there was a reason why they were doing that, and that did help because they brought down the Lane government, Jack Lane in New South Wales, you know, fell because of the New Guard to a certain extent. Um, and I just think that we need to have, to have the same sort of groups now, not to cause violence, never, but um, to show who we are, that we're Australian, that we're proud to be Australian. Because if we did that, it inspires people to be patriotic and it also, to a certain extent, influences politicians to do something about the problems that are being brought up at these rallies. Now, before you uh, began your nationalist activism. You had a previous life at uh, Melbourne University as a member of the, the Liberal Club. You were the, the, the treasurer of the club. What was it like being at Melbourne Uni? Because, well, they say that every university is a hotbed of leftist activists. And I also know that the Melbourne Uni uh, Liberal Club is known for its political uh, fights and divisions. So what, what was that like, that experience? I enjoyed it to a certain extent, joining the Liberal Club, um, but what I found was that I come from a lower middle class background. I never went to a really good high school and most of the kids at the Liberal Club were completely different to me from a socio-economic background and they were very elitist and they were very sort of, they looked down upon poor people, they, had, they made jokes against poor people which I found disgusting. It wasn't, not all of them, some of them, not all of them. And most of them also went to like Xavier and the really good schools, which is great. I think it's good that they went to those schools and good on them. But because of that, they kind of looked down on, you know, public school kids like myself who went to a, a Catholic school or a public school, or whatever. So I liked the politics. I liked, we had debates every Monday. I enjoyed all that. Good group of people, solid people, quite patriotic. I even helped create a tradition where we sell Anzac badges as a Liberal Club on campus and um, they've been doing it ever since. So I'm glad that I, I, I started that because now every year a Liberal Club uh, sells Anzac badges because I was part of the RSL. But uh, apart from that, we had plenty of opportunities to basically combat the left wing on campus. Probably every second day at least, every third day depending on the month, um, you have Social Alternative who are the radical communists on campus who would always set up a stall outside of Bailey Library uh, and also on South Lawn, whenever ever people go for lunch and frequently visit like a library or you know, a restaurant or something, or a coffee shop, sorry, they'd set up a stall there. And they give out their propaganda about refugees and all sorts of things. And um, my first year at uni, I was approached by a social alternative and they asked me to sign a petition. Now they didn't know who I was, obviously. They didn't know I was right wing. But what I did was I wanted to give them an impression, a shock value impression, to basically not to annoy me anymore because I didn't want them to approach me anymore. It was very annoying. 
So what I did was when they offered me to sign a petition, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll sign that. And instead of writing my name, I actually wrote stop the boats with an expletive <laughs> at the end. I won't say the expletive, it starts with C, the C word. Basically, they looked at me and like, oh, you are a, I'm not going to say it because they were, they were very rude and had a massive go at me. And I'm like, you know what? Go stuff yourself. I said something really rude to them. But I basically wanted to send a message to these lefties, these traitor communists, that don't ever approach me ever because I'll never, I was 18, I think. Yeah, I was 18 years old. I'll never subscribe to your point of view. And ever since then, not just did they not, not approach me, but whenever I pass, they'd always have a go at me. They're, oh, you're a fucking, you know, right me, oh, you're a racist or whatever. And I enjoy that because, you know, I, I like it when people do that. I like it when I, you know, I, I trigger. Yeah, they do a lot of screeching, those socialist students. Or, or, autistic screeching, yeah? Mm. Autistic screeching. <laughs> yeah. That's the but, ultra politically incorrect way to say. Yeah. But um, I, I'm sure you probably want to know more about some of the more extreme experiences of, of what I went through. So there was one time where during my master's degree, I did a subject and we, we had a guest lecturer and this lecturer, she was an old female, maybe 60 something years old. She was a boomer. And uh, this, this was about three, four years ago, probably three years ago. Yeah. And she basically was an, a hippie, an old hippie. And she, she mentioned that she was a hippie and she said that she was part of the anti-war movement during the Vietnam war. So she was part of the movement that spat on Australian soldiers who were coming back from the, from the war. Um, and she was proud of that. And she basically said, and before I go, before I, before I continue the story, just so you know, the class, because it was a master's class, it was only like about 12 students, most of which were international, Asians, etc. cetera. There was only about three, four Australians. I was one of them in that particular classroom. And she basically said when she was mentioning the Vietnam War that, and I'm paraphrasing here, she said, we invaded their country and the Viet Cong deserved to win and they should have won because we invaded their country. So this is an, apparently an Australian woman, 60 something years old, okay, who is telling a group of students, some of which are Australian, and even if they're not Australian, some of them Australian, it doesn't matter. But as an ambassador for Australia, she is literally, apparently, she's telling us that it was a good thing that the Anzacs, or sorry, the, 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 the diggers in Vietnam lost and that the Viet Cong won. I was so disgusted by what I heard I didn't even, I didn't want to, because I didn't want to get expelled. I just did, I just, I didn't want to say anything there. I just left the classroom. I just walked out and I remember I was swearing on my way down the steps. I was, I was walking down, down, I'm like, I'm, I, I was swearing my head off. I was punching the walls on it almost literally. And I'm like, this is insane. How the hell can they bring a guest lecturer to come and tell us that the Viet Cong should have won? If any, you know, it, it's, a, it's a disgrace to the people that fought there. It's disgusting that young Australian men died in Vietnam on the rice paddies and fields there at Long Tan, okay? And to think that this woman, so many years later, can say, oh, yeah, it's good that we lost and the Viet Cong won. It's kind of like a J Jane Fonda 2.0 Australian version. You know what I mean? And I basically made a complaint. I, I emailed my course coordinator, and she admitted that was wrong. She said that that was that was an inappropriate comment. And she said that she'll talk to this person. Um, so hopefully she learned a lesson and hopefully she said, you know, she wouldn't do that again, but the damage was done to him. Like it happened, it happens, but I just don't like how, and not only that, but I was the only one who reacted that way. You know, there were five students there, Australians. How come they didn't react like that? And that, that's what, I just think that we're, we're dumbing down people. Like people say, oh, you know, they have a right to their opinion. Yeah, they do, they have a right to their opinion as stupid as, that, as her opinion is, as treasonous as it, is, as it is, but at the same time, we have a right to protest against it. And yeah, I silently protested yeah. by, by walking out and making a complaint. Yeah, it's good that you've got this attitude that I'm not going to cop this being acceptable. And obviously you're <laughs> causing a lot of grief to people who have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are. But yeah, it's what we need more of. Yeah. Now, university, unfortunately, as you probably know, it's, it's infected, man. It's, a, it's an agar plate. You know, agar plates um, back, in, back in science class, it's an agar plate for leftist culture. That's how I describe it. Yeah. It constantly grows. It gets worse, you know? Pretty accurate. Yeah. Well, 
Stefanos, I've enjoyed our discussion. We've explored a wide variety of ideas and topics. I'm sure Australian meditations will continue to grow and uh, further uh, create uh, more uh, content and archive uh, future uh, events. So I encourage everyone to subscribe to Australian Meditations. It's also a Facebook page as well and, and binge on a few videos. No worries, Tim. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I really appreciate it. And um, as a final comment, I'd like to say definitely look into Australian history. I'm passionate about Australian history. I think that a lot of the answers to today's questions you will find if you study the real Australian history. I'll leave it at that. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. We've still got some big names on their way to Tour Australia. Dr. Stephen Hicks, who was on this show last week, has his Adventures in Postmodernism tour from March the 9th, visiting Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Adelaide. And unlike other tours, tickets are well within everyone's budget and includes a photo and getting your book signed at no extra charge. Everyone's a VIP. So it's excellent value, so go to truearrowevents.com and make sure you use the coupon code POMO to get a 10% discount on tickets. Then there is the Conversation About Feminism Tour featuring bad feminist Roxane Gay and factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers, which should prove to be a lively debate. I'm seeing ads for it on Facebook all the time, so it is certainly being billed as a big event. The Unshackled is once again a sponsor of the Next Liberty Fest Conference, which is being held in Perth for the first time organized by our good friends at Liberty Works on the 8th and 9th of March. So you can book your place by going to libertyfest.org.au. Remember that The Unshackled can only continue to expand with the support of our followers, and there are plenty of ways to support us. You can pledge over at Patreon at patreon.com slash The Unshackled, and directly via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash The Unshackled. You also have our premium membership option on our website, which is theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. We are still waiting for our Subscribestar account to be approved, so that will be launching soon. And of course, we have our online store, uprightmarket.com, where you can buy some right-thinking merchandise, which also supports The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.